Jeff Center's book talk, Under Beijing Shadow, Southeast Asia's China Challenge. I'm Jay Rosengard, a faculty member at the Harvard Kennedy School. I'm thrilled to host this book talk. I've been an avid reader of Murray Hebert's brilliant dispatches from Asia for many years, but have never had the privilege of meeting him in person. And this, in this age of COVID-19, this is probably the closest we'll come to at least for now. And uh, for those of you who don't know, Murray Hebert is a senior associate of the Southeast Asia program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS, in Washington, DC. I'm also delighted that Elena Noor has agreed to serve as our respondent. And when you hear her comments, you'll appreciate our good fortune um, in having her join us today. She is a director political security affairs and deputy director um, at the Asia Society Policy Institute in Washington, DC. Before we begin, the Ash Center would like to acknowledge the land on which Harvard sits as a traditional territory of the Massachusetts people and a place which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among nations. Regarding, regarding the format of the talk, uh, Murray has said he'd really like a dialogue, so he'll speak for about 20 minutes, and then Elena will respond for about 10 minutes, and we'll try to leave uh, the remainder of the time, about half the session, for a Q&A. We encourage you to submit questions at any time throughout the presentation using the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. And finally, uh, this event is being recorded and can be found on the Ash Center website and YouTube channel after the event has concluded. So you can share it with your friends and colleagues who are not able to attend this afternoon. And so without further ado, let us all now seek enlightenment under Murray's shadow. So over to you, Murray. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's a pretty big responsibility um, to give you enlightenment. Um, so what I'm going to do, as Jay said, that I, I've, I completed this book, uh, it was released in August. And what it does is it tries to re uh, describe how countries in Southeast Asia respond to China country by country, because each, each country is very different of the, the 10 countries. Uh, some are big and some are small, some are democratic, some aren't, and some are rich and poor. And so they're very different. But one thing that is pretty uh, much the same is they view relations with China as both an opportunity and a challenge. Um, I'm what I do in the book is describe the the raft of uh, plethora of uh, uh, ways in which China engages through soft power, through it's like economic relations, cultural, educational exchanges, um, hard power, including military threats, South China Sea, or military sales, that kind of stuff. Um, the one, the area in which universally every country likes relations with China is the extent to which their uh, trade has exploded since China opened up. So two-way trade in, um, with, with the 10 countries of Southeast Asia hit 600 billion in, in 2018. That's twice the level of US trade in 2018. Uh, the, they also really appreciated all the tourists that were flooding in. If you visited Southeast Asia recently, and well, maybe pre-COVID, I mean, uh, now you don't find many Chinese, I would guess, but it previously, you know, all the airports were bustling with Chinese who would always buck in in front of you on the visa line, <laughs> which got frustrating. Uh, the uh, most, most countries also, um, uh, really do appreciate the Belt and Road Initiative under which they can get loans uh, and uh, uh, technology and uh, help in, in building infrastructure from railroads to dams to uh, highways. Uh, but it, it's, it, was, it was puzzling to me how hard, I didn't really realize how hard China had to work at making these projects work. With the, with the railroad now in Laos, uh, it, it, which is going to be completed in 2022. It was to be completed next year, but it's being, it's was slowed by the COVID. 
It took them five years to negotiate that. And tiny little Laos, 7 million people, 17, 18 billion dollar uh, GDP f- struggled with China uh, on how much land China would get on each side of the railroad, what the interest rates would be. Uh, it, it was just really a, a difficult negotiation. And the ties are still negotiating. They've had over 30 rounds of negotiations till since 2014, and they still haven't gotten agreement. They also have problems in, in countries like Indonesia with the high-speed rail from Bandung, uh, Jakarta to Bandung, uh, getting land. Uh, land in, in many of, of Southeast Asian countries is really tough to get for projects. Uh, and, and China is learning that. Um, and, but one of the, uh, I tried to figure out how much money China has kicked into Southeast Asia, the 10 countries since 2013. And it's really tough. Uh, but uh, RWR Associates in Washington follows that they are the Belt and Road Clarefly. They came out with a figure in five years after 2013 of 200 million which seems high to me. Having visited all these countries to do research, I, um, I found that a little high, but who knows. Um, <clears throat> the, the, uh, another problem I, I should have mentioned is that many of these projects, uh, a good number of them get caught up in corruption and hefty kickbacks. And this happened in Malaysia with the East Coast Rail Link. Uh, China overpaid, uh, overcharged and then uh, is alleged to have kicked back some of that money to Prime Minister Najib, who was involved in a, uh, the 1MDB financial scandal, and he needed money to pay off massive surging debts. Um, the, the, uh, but one thing that has happened, then when, when, when the new uh, Prime Minister came in in Malaysia, uh, he, um, Prime Minister Mahathir 2.0, I guess, he, he, um, he canceled the, the East Coast Rail Link, but then did over uh, 11 months or so renegotiate the scale of the project, the cost, et cetera. So we're finding that China is somewhat willing to, um, to accommodate um, uh, with, with, uh, with the demands of the, of the locals. Um, Often the projects are quite controversial. In, uh, in Indonesia, for example, um, uh, President Jokowi came under sharp criticism in 2019 from his opponents, at least one of whom, General Prabowo, is now in his cabinet, but they sharply criticized him for depending so heavily on China. The other area where China is very active is the Digital Silk Road. Uh, uh, the Chinese, uh, uh, Firms such as Alibaba, Tencent, JD.com, et cetera, have invested billions in Singapore and Indonesia primarily, uh, invested in, 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 um, in, um, in, in companies like Gojek, Tokopedia, uh, Traveloka, um, and really gave them a giant boost uh, in, in taking off in their countries. Huawei is the, the company that uh, President Trump has criticized a lot and has nudged countries not to accept deals to, to introduce 5G in their countries, is accepted by all the Southeast Asian countries except Vietnam, which is going its own way totally, and uh, Singapore, which, which um, uh, uh, did the major contracting with Nokia and Ericsson, but then gave uh, uh, Huawei, a couple of smaller contracts. Um, you know, Ch- Chinese have been migrating to Southeast Asia for uh, generate for for centuries, literally. Um, but it, the in in that really, it's in some cases like Indonesia, you've had protests and very, uh, very violent protests, even in 1965, 2000, uh, 1998. You've had them in Malaysia in 1969, but generally the older Chinese population uh, that's been there longer does okay. But uh, the newcomers create some anxiety. There were in in Indonesia and the uh, island of Sulawesi, there have been protests this year against the Chinese workers working in mines. The thing, the migration that has me most concerned is what's happening in Northern Myanmar and Northern Laos. 
You go up to Mandalay and North, it's all ethnic Chinese. I don't think the government has anything to do with this. I think it's mostly spontaneous, but nobody is, is putting their finger in the dike to try to slow it. Same in Northern Laos. So you have a lot of Chinese coming in, uh, growing rubber trees, bananas, watermelons, pumpkins, you name it, and trucks just flowing out uh, uh, all day long with, with produce for, for China. And then in some cases like uh, uh, um, Sihanoukville, they have been involved in setting up casinos, which became quite unpopular and eventually were closed uh, at the turn of this year uh, because the Chinese asked Hung Sen uh, to close them. And so he agreed to do that. And a lot of those guys have now moved across the border into uh, Cayenne State in Myanmar setting up casinos in places like called names like Shui Koko. Um, the history is, I, I talk a little bit about history, not very much though, but in some cases it is, it is uh, quite, it remains quite influential and that's in Indonesia because of the alleged Chinese involvement in the 1965 coup and the massacre that followed that. But the, the, in all countries, there is still frustration with um, the fact that uh, China, after the Communist Party after 1949, it supported communist forces against uh, the governments in, most, uh, in all the countries. A couple of countries like Vietnam appreciated China's involvement, but most of them uh, did not. Um, I'm gonna just, uh, you know, there's not opinion polls that are, are terribly good on this, but every year I see the, uh, Institute for Southeast Asian Studies in, in uh, Singapore does a poll of the elite opinions in uh, the countries of uh, Southeast Asia. And the poll that came out this January um, showed that 79% of the elites in Southeast Asia said that China was, quote, the most influential country in the region, unquote. Uh, only 8% said that about the United States, which is a little shocking uh, that the US has that low uh, uh, a standing. 52% said China would be the most influent, is the most influential politically and strategically. And only 27%, about half the number of China said it was, uh, that was the United States. And interestingly, that if they were forced to choose between China and the US, however, uh, of the elite opinion, opinion shapers that answered the poll, 46% said they would choose China, 54% said the United States. Military to military ties, sorry, I'm just gonna try to, I'm flying through giving just highlights of some of the themes in the book. And we can, you know, if something uh, interests you, we can pursue that. Militarily, the military to military ties have been um, uh, really quite slow in taking off. Um, China has started to sell arms in some cases, like uh, selling 28 tanks and three submarines to the, the Thais after the, the coup government took over in, in 2014. Two of those, the number two and three subs have already been postponed. Malaysia has ordered four coastal patrol vessels from China, but two will actually be manufactured in Malaysia. Um, there's an increasing number of exercises and dialogues, but they're much less than, let's say, with the United States. The one area militarily that has is creating some heartburn, quite a bit of heartburn in, in some neighboring countries, is that China looks to be establishing a, a some kind of a military relationship with the REAM. Uh, naval base just outside of Sihanoukville on, uh, on the edge of the Gulf of Thailand. Uh, in the last month, uh, that base, which had some help from the United States over the years, has knocked down two of the buildings that were, were actually built with American aid um, for training purposes. They've knocked those down and, you know, that is kind of symbolic. If you knock those down, what are you going to replace them with? Uh, so it's likely... Um, uh, China and, and there were uh, the Wall Street Journal broke a story uh, about a year and a half ago now about secret deals between um, China and Reim base to um, to allow at least let the Chinese use the base uh, 
on a maybe rotating basis or maybe like the US uses Singapore, for example. But we don't know, but, but it, is, it is something to watch, which gives total heartburn to the Vietnamese because, and the Thais because this base is really very close to Southern Vietnam and, and, and to the Gulf of Thailand where Thailand has, has a big naval and big air base. Um, there's a lot of, China is using a lot of soft power, inviting a lot of students to come to uh, Southeast, uh, to, to China. Uh, it, it, a lot of them get scholarships. Uh, a lot of them are students who can't, whose parents or for some reason can't get uh, easy access to visit, to go to the United States or the UK, Australia, end up going to China. In 2016, the last year for which I could get macro figures, uh, there were 68,000 Southeast Asians studying in China. Uh, 23,000 of them were Thais, 15,000 were Indonesians, 11 or 12,000 were Vietnamese. Uh, China is also busy setting up Confucius Institutes. There are about 30 in the region to train uh, Mandarin language. Uh, um, 15 of the 30 are in Thailand, there's five in Malaysia, there's one in Vietnam, there's one or two in the Philippines. So uh, I think it's how friendly you are with China is an indicator of how many Confucius Institutes you might have. The other thing that, that uh, China is doing is inviting a lot of uh, academics, journalists, religious leaders, uh, and even uh, uh, political party officials. Um, they are, it's, it's really interesting that out of, uh, in, um, in Indonesia, you PDI, PDIP and um, uh, this, which is uh, Jokowi's and, and uh, Megawati's party um, ha are sending officials there as is the Democratic Party. And I asked some of the, of those guys what they do there. And they, you know, I, you're not Marxist Leninist. What are you learning there? And they're learning how to you know, how to recruit, how to, how to budget, uh, how to make the party more active and more responsive to people's needs, I guess. Uh, and in, in Malaysia, you also have the uh, UMNO party and the, the old MCA, the Chinese, uh, Malaysian Chinese Association. They regularly send officials to China. The thing that's the somewhat uh, is really interesting is how China is going after Muslim leaders. And so they, they do, for example, take Enu, uh, uh, the uh, Muslim, um, big Muslim association in Indonesia, take a lot of people from there. Uh, they, the imams that, that go often come back and say pretty positive things. They say it's, it's, you know, people are, it's like a work camp kind of a thing. It's as much what the Chinese say. They, it's, uh, they can eat halal, they pray five times a day, et cetera. Um, and and if, if you say the right thing, you will, in the case of at least one a mosque in Western Java, the, uh, the imam went, got, came back with a positive um, description and ended up uh, getting a new irrigation facility for his village and the surrounding areas. Um, I tried to ascertain to what extent China was involved in trying to politically influence places, uh, countries in the region. It's really hard to get much, much information. They, um, I don't know if they do much less than the, in, in Southeast Asia than they do in Australia or New Zealand or, or what, but you you saw you see things like where in the 2018 elections uh, the Chinese ambassador very actively campaigned in in uh, Malaysia uh, for UMNO and uh, Malaysia Chinese uh, um, Chinese Association candidates uh, they didn't all do that well MCA almost got wiped out except for the head of it. Um, the, the, in the Philippines, there's wide assumption that, that Duterte got money from China through, through tycoons in Davao City where he was the mayor. That's not proven, but everybody tells you that story. Um, in Singapore, when Singapore and uh, gave, criticized China for some of the stuff it was doing in the South China Sea in 2016, uh, the uh, Prime Minister Lee did, and um, 
China then started putting pressure on, on Singapore in various ways. And one of the things that happened is uh, they lobbied businessmen. And China, uh, excuse me, Singapore is the biggest investor in China. In Chongqing, they have a huge, huge projects right now. And, and the businessmen were lobbied by the Chinese government saying, tell, tell your government that if they don't shape up, uh, that we will uh, have to, you know, make you know, life could become more difficult for you. The, some businessmen did lobby, they said, and the government basically yelled at them, said, leave foreign policy to us, thank you very much. Um, China is involved in at least some hacking and phishing. Uh, it, and it, it's no, um, it, it doesn't respect even its communist allies and quote unquote communist allies in Vietnam. Uh, and when Vietnam was hosting uh, APEC in 2017, uh, uh, Chinese uh, were really both fishing and hacking to figure out Vietnam's position on for APEC um, and also what its uh, negotiating positions would be on the RCEP, the new agreement, uh, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement that was signed this weekend, uh, and it, which, which includes China, South Korea, etc. China, Australia, um, Japan, South Korea, and, and New Zealand, India pulled out. But it uh, it's also hacked into Singapore Health and got every a lot of people's uh, um, ph uh, pharm pharmaceutical prescriptions, figure out what diseases they have. Um, and when the Indonesian elections happened in 2019, the officials said they were hacked a lot by both Chinese and Russians who were going after voter lists. Um, I know, I realize I'm coming close to the end. I'm going to just talk, I think probably many of you, if you follow China, are going to know quite a bit about the South China Sea, but maybe a little less about the Mekong, which has become a lot hotter in the last 18 months or so. But China has, has uh, built 11 dams in the northern reaches of the, uh, uh, the, the Mekong. And behind that is are holding uh, uh, an awful lot of water, some estimates, uh, suggest they're holding about as much water there as would could fill the whole Chesapeake Bay, the big bay right close to Washington here. Uh, and what the cost of that, what the what the what the damage of that is, is that uh, the lower Mekong countries, along which about which includes Laos, Cambodia, and Thailand, and um, and Viet Southern Vietnam, what what. What, what the, the impact is that they have far less water, uh, especially now in, a, in two years of, of lower rainfall. And so there's a lot of anxiety that China ultimately, it set up a, a, lo, a Mekong, uh, Langsang Mekong uh, committee, uh, commission uh, to, to work on providing aid and development in the lower Mekong countries. However, its aid is never going to be enough to cover the costs of basically dislocating 60 million uh, farmers and fishers that work along the river. So there's now some efforts uh, to try to put pressure on China um, to share information about how much water it's storing and, uh, and maybe be a little more generous in sharing some of that water uh, with the lower Mekong countries uh, during the rainy season. You know, the, the South China Sea is a very big deal, but I think it's covered a fair amount in the news. But if, if somebody wants to pursue that a little bit more, I'm gonna let us do that during the discussion. And I'll now turn it back to Jay and Alina. So Alina, the floor is yours, please. So thank you. Um, I really appreciate Murray's writings on Southeast Asia as well. I'm a big fan. Um, his book is a tome, and I think it's testament to how <laughs> comprehensive uh, research, how much comprehensive research he's done in the region, um, going on the ground as well to talk to people in true journalistic um, essence. So I really enjoyed reading the book, Murray. Um, I guess I have three responses, um, and they're not necessarily in response to uh, Murray's book or what he's already brought up in his comments, but 
more in general uh, when talking about Southeast Asia's relations with China. And the first is that uh, very often, I think particularly in Washington and the Beltway, but maybe further afield as well. I uh, was in Hawaii for a while. I, I noticed this trend in Hawaii as well. There is a tendency to view Southeast Asia and China through a particular lens. And that lens is the US uh, possibly Beltway lens. And it's very, very important to view Southeast Asia's relations with China from a Southeast Asian lens too, um, which I think Murray has tried to do very well in his book. And, and you'll find that there is a huge difference uh, between those two lenses. Because if you view it from a primarily US lens, you often miss the agency that Southeast Asian states have in dealing with China and uh, tend to be dismissive of it even. So for example, with the 1MDB scandal in Malaysia, uh, when the East Coast Rail Link project was suspended, if you were following international media, you would have seen that there was all this commentary and conjecture about uh, Malaysia having swung away from China right after the Mali 2.0 government came into power. And that was primarily seen through a great power lens. But if you followed what was going on in Malaysia domestically, you'll have seen that it was mainly domestic concerns and priorities that really uh, drove the reconsideration of big ticket projects like the East Coast Rail Link. So to, to view some of these issues with China as a, a great power competition between China and the US and Southeast Asia, making choices, I think is uh, sometimes very short-sighted and um, not very constructive at all. Uh, a second example that I'll give is with uh, the recently signed Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, RCEP. Again, a lot of commentary has uh, painted RCEP as a China-driven agreement, which it is not. It is an ASEAN-driven agreement. It was um, consolidated by 10 ASEAN countries along with its dialogue partners. And so there's this tendency to sometimes overinflate China's influence in the region. Um, now, having said that, of course, there are some countries with uh, lesser agency uh, in Southeast Asia vis-a-vis -vis China. But I think it's always important to keep in mind that with regards to the Belt and Road Initiative, countries always have an agency in dealing with China. And so long as that negotiation is done with both parties in agreement of what is expected, uh, then the host countries can actually push back on China. And we've seen this multiple times. Um, there is a lot of commentary again on what happened with Sri Lanka. I think if you delve into the Hamantota project, you'll see that there were a lot of other uh, factors that played into Sri Lanka's decision to take on um, the kinds of terms and conditions that um, they eventually negotiated with China. Similarly with uh, Malaysia, again, um, I, so I had the good fortune of working on uh, Malaysia's assessment of the BRI and having talked to people on the ground, it dawned on me that really there are little things, uh, things like whether Chinese construction companies should put up a sign in all Chinese characters against a red backdrop, um, you know, that, that would essentially take over the whole landscape of a particular construction project. Those things uh, can be negotiated and they're often pushed upon local councils or local governments because um, the Chinese construction companies just assume that that's what is to be done because they're so used to doing that in China. But if local laws are laid down and um, are, uh, um, are illustrated up front, um, I think you'll find that there would be a lot more pushback from um, a number of countries. Uh, second point I'll bring up is that um, in Southeast Asia, I think many of you who study Southeast Asia already know this, there is a very pragmatic approach to dealing with the major powers simply because of the sheer size of countries like China and the US. Um, and I think you see this most clearly with the pandemic now. Um, China, despite all its flaws, managed to open up its uh, factories uh, relatively early compared to the rest of the world. And with RCEP having been signed, I, see, I think what you'll see is an increasing trend towards not only greater intra-ASEAN trade, 
but also an increased volume of trade with China, um, especially in this post-COVID, or I guess we're still in COVID recovery. Um, you know, China and ASEAN trade has gone up, as Murray has said, and the trade volume. Uh, in terms of trade volume, ASEAN is now uh, China's number one trading partner. And I think you'll see that trend continue for the next few years. Um, and along with that, this pragmatic approach with the Mekong, I don't think it's that mainland Southeast Asian countries don't care about the environmental impact um, of the dams. They do, but their sheer size again um, and proximity of China being on these borders sometimes weighs a little bit more uh, nuanced um, approaches that they have to take. Uh, final point uh, is on inclusion and inclusivity. Again, I think you'll find that many Southeast Asian countries have a very inclusive foreign policy approach towards the major powers, which can sometimes be both aggravating and um, confounding to outside observers. Uh, but it's all part of the historical legacy of being small countries in a very strategic part of the world. And Southeast Asian countries are not new to this geopolitical game. There are also uh, a number of tensions that have gone unresolved in Southeast Asia that uh, plays into this, this, this inclusion uh, uh, approach towards uh, the major powers. Um, and, and I think the combination of both a pragmatic and inclusive foreign policy approach is perhaps best encapsulated by a quote that Murray brought up in his book from Amade, you know, if a country, and of course I'm paraphrasing here, um, if you identify a country as your enemy, it will become a self-fulfilling prophecy. And no small country in Southeast Asia wants to do that against the giants of China, uh, the US and the like. So I'll stop here um, and look forward to a good discussion. Wow, so a tour de force from the author covering 600 pages in about 20 minutes and very insightful responses. So thank you very much. Um, we have some great questions that have been submitted, but I'm going to use my prerogative as the moderator to ask the first question. Um, and I'm going to try to be constructively uh, provocative. And it has to do with the concept of crypto colonialism. I don't know if, if you're familiar with it, but it was coined by a recently retired colleague at Harvard from the anthropology department, Michael Hertzfeld. And he was talking especially about Greece and Thailand uh, when he did this. And the concept is that crypto colonial countries claim to have avoided colonial domination. I'm quoting from Michael, but in reality are heavily dependent on an indirectly but militarily subject to intrusive control by colonial powers. The term sig signals the curious alchemy whereby certain countries were compelled to acquire their political independence at the expense of massive economic dependence. Such countries were and are living paradoxes. They are nominally independent, but that independence comes at the price of a sometimes humiliating form of effective dependence. So my question for the author, Murray, is China a crypto colonialist anywhere in Southeast Asia. <laughs> Yikes. <clears throat> um, uh, I think it's probably pretty close in Cambodia, uh, where Cambodia, uh, for example, uh, when the ASEAN grouping will want to uh, come up with a a um, statement criticizing China for some of its assertive behavior in the South China Sea, uh, and particularly in 2012, after uh, China had just taken over Scarborough Shoal from the Philippines, um, uh, Cambodia blocked the ability of the grouping to uh, have a, a um, united statement. And without un unanimity, you don't have a statement coming out of ASEAN. And so uh, they didn't have one. Actually, they came up with another one some weeks later, but, but during the meeting, they couldn't come up with one because, China, uh, because Cambodia was, uh, was basically doing China's bidding. Um, uh, that's the closest, uh, I think, 
I don't think you would say that Thailand uh, has become that even during after the coup when the US criticized uh, Thailand, uh, for example, did not agree with, with China to do the railroad, still hasn't agreed to do the railroad after six years and 30 rounds of talks. So they're not a colonial uh, uh, country, but Laos, Laos is also in some ways in that situation. Um, they, they are were a little less during their uh, turn as ASEAN chair were a little less uh, leaning toward China, but they were pretty close. Uh, but one of the, the more alarming things that's happened in, in Laos is that uh, in, in mid-September, uh, the, the uh, EDL, which is the uh, electricity distribution company, uh, agreed to have a Chinese company take over uh, it take over the EDL, the China Southern Power Company, uh, because the EDL was so hopelessly in debt and there was no way that they, it's a government company, there's no way they could think of how to restructure it. And I think it's really unfortunate that they turned themselves over to the Chinese because the IMF and various international financial institutions and some of uh, Laos's neighbors were offering that they might be able to come up with another alternative. Uh, but China, Laos just gave it in, gave in to China, which, which stunned me because uh, uh, I think they would know that that would not please either Vietnam or Laos, its two very biggest neighbors. Um, but it's an interesting concept, this crypto uh, colonialism. Yeah, and you, in, Cam in your chapter on Cambodia, you, you use the term, if I'm not mistaken, uh, client state or coming close to a client state, which echoes that some of those sentiments a little bit. And you, you gave um, some very good examples. I believe that was the first time ever that Oz an ASEAN summit did not have a closing statement. Mm. Um, we have a great question here from colleague at the Ash Center, Professor David Dapis, a longtime expert on Southeast Asia. What is the impact of the pandemic on ASEAN country perceptions of China? Uh, it's an interesting question, David, thanks. Um, you know, at, at first, uh, when China let the, let the COVID run rampant in Wuhan for a couple of weeks and then let it spread during Lunar New Year, there was a, quite a bit of irritation, um, but then they saw that China pretty quickly snapped too and got control of COVID. And like Elena said in her comments, uh, they have been very quick to reopen their uh, economy and get it going uh, fairly well. And that obviously has a huge impact on Southeast Asia, which sells China an awful lot of raw materials and sells them and an awful lot of components for the global supply chain. And so they benefit from that. Um, countries like Vietnam um, have to, for, for all of Vietnam's giant export machine, it has to import a lot of the, the components for these exports, as you know, David, uh, being a longtime Vietnam person. Um, uh, I think now it's, now they're wondering what the heck about the United States. Uh, I, I think China is going to sort of come out of this. Um, uh, okay, uh, they're, they wish the tourists could resume. Uh, that's, that's hurting Southeast Asia still. But, um, but they fear that the United States is, is probably more to blame than anybody now for letting this just continue running rampant for the second and third wave. Thank you. Um, and speaking of Vietnam, we have a question from uh, a colleague from Vietnam. A quote, I don't think Vietnam is really willing to accommodate China's one belt, one road initiative. What is your viewpoint about this? <laughs> uh, well, uh, Vietnam is formally a member. It joined the Belt and Road, <laughs> but uh, it has not, um, uh, there is, only one project that I can think of, uh, and that is the SkyTrain in Hanoi, which actually the work on that started a number of years before the Belt and Road was launched, but China has now included it in the Belt and Road. And that is a disastrous project, as anybody from Vietnam knows, uh, or goes to Vietnam knows that things have been under construction for a decade, the costs go up and the steel 
bars keep falling off and hitting people and taxis and motorcycles down below. It, it, it is not China's uh, brightest hour, that project. Uh, I, I'm starting to wonder if it'll ever get done. Uh, but yeah, Vietnam has been rather reluctant. Um, so the closest point for Kunming to the ocean is, is Haiphong in northern, the big port in northern Vietnam. China was proposing a number of years ago uh, that it, it would like to build a highway from Kunming to, to Haiphong and said, we'll pay for it with our, you know, we'll benefit the most from it. And the Vietnamese said, build it to our border. We'll build it the rest of the way and got to, to Haiphong. And they, uh, I think they took out a, a loan from the ADB, if I remember. So there's, um, <clears throat> and Chinese projects are rather, many of them are rather unpopular as, as anybody that spends time in Vietnam knows there, there is the, the uh, uh, steel mill in, in Northern Vietnam in Peng Hoa, which is a, actually it's built by a Taiwan plastic company but it was it, it, the the owners are Taiwan Plastic Company, but they uh, but they were a lot of the work was most of the construction work was being done by the Chinese, and even some of the early workers were were Chinese. I don't know if they still are, but there was an awful lot of of uh, pollution that came out of that at, um, facility and ended up killing the fish in the ocean. This thing is very close to the South, South China Sea, killing the fish on the sea in five neighboring states, provinces. And so um, that was rather unpopular, as are the coal-fired power plants around in, in uh, South Central uh, Vietnam, uh, uh, Viet Southern Vietnam, uh, in like play around Phan Rang and Phan Thiet, they have these coal-fired uh, plants that are very polluting and making it very difficult for farmers to grow produce for, for agriculture and, and for the market. And there, uh, uh, 2018, when there were big protests against the uh, special economic zone law that the Vietnamese parliament was considering, Farmers were also protesting here and they were protesting something very different and they turned quite violent and they overturned police cars and all that stuff. And, uh, <clears throat> but part that was a concern about pollution that was coming out of uh, Chinese coal, coal plants. So one of the reasons Vietnam wants very much to get its gas going, um, uh, gas projects off the coast because they would like to switch to more gas fired uh, options rather than coal but China keeps scaring away most of the foreign oil companies. <laughs> There's still ExxonMobil with the uh, blue elephant and we'll see, no, the blue whale. Why did I call it an elephant? <laughs> <laughs> blue whale. And, you know, it'll be interesting to see whether under these current pricing conditions of oil and gas and, uh, and the China's pressure in the South China Sea, if, if Vietnam goes ahead, uh, excuse me, if ExxonMobil goes ahead with this project, but it is to bring gas onto around uh, Quang Ai, Da Nang area, and, and really fire up the power needs of central, central Vietnam. Again, in an Ash book talk, no easy questions. So I've got another one for you um, from uh, an anonymous attendee. How is China gaining influence by attracting Muslims or training political parties in other countries despite their discrimination against Uyghurs, um, the Muslim minority, and the fact that they don't have a variety of political parties? So um, <laughs> it's actually two questions. It's two questions. One, but... Yeah. When I tell my students you have one question, they say A and B. So there you go. <laughs> okay, that's a new one for me, but um... <laughs> Yeah, so on the on the Muslims, their their goal is really just to uh, the China goal for inviting the imams is really just to quiet the uh, protest. So there were some protests a couple of years ago in front of the embassy in Jakarta, but but those have been pretty much uh, quietened by by China's sort of charm offensive. Uh, so it, it's not convincing anybody in, 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 in Indonesia and uh, Malaysia that its policies are great. It's just trying to prevent more uh, protests. Um, both, both Indonesia and Malaysia have been very hard on uh, 
uh, Myanmar's ha handling of the Muslim Rohingya minority that that a lot uh, that about 750 800,000 were kicked out in uh, in uh, 2017 and early 2018 meant most of them going to Bangladesh but but Indonesia and Malaysia have both been critical uh, of that but they but then when when uh, Prime Minister Mahathir um, was uh, prime minister, he was asked about Xinjiang once and why you criticize uh, some, some human rights and not others. And he said, you know, it's really not up to a small country to tell a country like China what to do. Uh, that usually doesn't keep him from doing it, but he, that's what his answer was. Uh, <clears throat> let's see, the second part, well, oh, parties. Political parties. So, yeah, that, I don't think they're trying to, there, there's no effort to convert them to communism. I mean, that's the first question you have to ask, ask one of these guys that goes, right? Uh, and they say there's no effort at that. It's really, I see it as mostly part of their charm offensive. Take them to China, wine and dine them, uh, sh show them how great China is, what it's achieved. Uh, and then they, they do have some classes, but they're not very uh, about things like budgets and recruiting, but it's, it's not terribly serious. Uh, it's more part of the charm offensive along with uh, um, teachers and journalists and par uh, 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 village leaders. And you know, chi China's just in inviting an awful lot of people to try and, and uh, impress them on what they've achieved. Thank you. So um, here's um, another question for you. Um, if you thought my crypto colonialism question was provocative, here's here's something else for you. Um, China continues. Is to flex its muscles threat that China's borders continue to expand and absorb the smaller countries in their neighborhood. I'm thinking of Cambodia, Vietnam, Thailand, Laos, Burma, maybe even into Eurasia as well. What is your opinion about China expanding its borders in the long run? Yeah. <clears throat> it, um, um, it has renegotiated the land borders with, with Vietnam, as you uh, may know that in 1979, China invaded across the border. And it, after that, it was pretty clear that the borders were not very well defined up there. So a lot of them dated back to the French colonial period. So they renegotiated and the Vietnamese tell you that they did a, it was a pretty serious effort on both sides and the Chinese were not unrealistic, not unfair. Uh, so if we'll give you these 100, 100 meters here, you give us 100 meters there. It was a bit of a horse trading. And, and uh, I, uh, the, the former uh, Vietnamese ambassador here was the lead negotiator and he said it was pretty, pretty, uh, uh, pretty balanced and, and fair. And the Lao also did that. I, I've never been able to talk to a negotiator from Laos, so I don't know how that went. I, I don't think too badly. I think China is quite sensitive to how this is gonna go down if they would do that. But as I said in my opening comments, I, what I, I'm more alarmed at is just the free flow of ethnic Chinese into Northern Myanmar and into Northern Laos uh, I think it's companies and uh, just individuals doing this on their own. I don't see the hand of Kunming or, or um, uh, uh, Beijing at all behind this, but they're not doing much to stop it. Um, and I think it could really bite them uh, if, they're, if, if something goes wrong, there could be uh, you know, relations between the majority population of Chinese get turned sour. It could be, could be pretty hot and explosive. And that's what I'm more worried about. Um, so, you know, I, I think even in, so not, I think the other thing that you have to say is nobody's relations with China or the United States or with each other, or maybe a husband and wife or with somebody, you know, your relations aren't static. They don't just stay level at all the time, right? And so relations fluctuate back and forth. And you see this 
a little bit in, in Laos or Vietnam, the two communist countries on com, uh, communist countries border, they, it depends a little bit who the leader is. And they'll have very anti-Chinese leaders and then they'll push back, but then the guy, be, uh, next guy might be more accommodating. But I, I think uh, we haven't seen the last chapter in Cambodia yet. Uh, there is no country close to China where, where ch the Chinese are adored uh, by the population. Um, there's just a lot of worry that they're going to just stampede over us. And so the concerns you raise are the concerns a lot of people have. And China has got to be sensitive to it, I hope. Yeah, and we also might keep in mind if we want to be um, somewhat optimistic, um, Alina's comments about um, pragmatic and inclusive foreign policy, um, remembering the non-aligned movement started in Indonesia way back and their policies during the Cold War. Again, I, I, like, I like the term inclusivity. Others talk about balancing but trying to deal with all the different tensions that you mentioned, Murray. We have a, we have a lot of questions um, back to the, the Mekong issues, but this one in particular is a point also that uh, David Dapis has made. This is from Suzanne Ogden at Northeastern University. It is true that Chinese dams on the Mekong contribute to drought conditions in Southeast Asia, but so do the other lower Mekong Basin countries. For example, like China, Laos has built large dams on the Mekong mainstream, and other countries like Cambodia built dams and tributaries to the Mekong, thereby also contributing to drought conditions. Further, the lower Mekong countries siphon off water from the tributaries for irrigation and urbanization. The overall annual contribution of water flow from China to the Mekong is under 20%. Its contribution is greater during the dry season, 24%, but the rest of the water more than 75% comes from the lower Mekong countries of Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, and Vietnam. They too hold a lot back for their own use. So the idea is there's a lot of debate about the dams in the upper Mekong and contributing to um, drought or environmental degradation, lower Mekong, but this is often uh, perhaps uh, deflecting responsibility from the countries in question. So uh, again, based on your observations, um, what do you think of, of this um, observation? No, I, I think you're right. I, I, um, you are right. I was simplifying it too much, I guess, to, to try to tell the story in, you know, like three minutes or something. Um, but, but absolutely. Uh, and Laos is, is now, uh, uh, to, has, has, has started the clock on starting a new dam, uh, which is, is on the mainstream, it's got two and it's starting a third one, which is, is absolutely ridiculous. Um, but still, you know, the 20 or 24%, you know, the 24% during dry season, that is not, it's not nothing. Um, but I, and I, I think that uh, Laos is going to, uh, and Cambodia, interestingly, Hun Sen, the, the um, close friend of China, canceled two Chinese dam, no, he postponed for 10 years, two Chinese dam projects. Um, but, but they have dams on the, on the tributaries, as Laos has a ton of them on the tributaries. Um, but, but your point is, is well taken. I think Laos, um, uh, so now Laos is getting in because of the collapse of the dam in Atapu in 2018 in southern Laos. The ties of the Thai NGOs have become much more critical of of uh, uh, the government constantly signing uh, power purchase agreements from Laos, which gives them then the the, the uh, gives them the wherewithal to basically sign for loans and, and get credit from China and others. And the Thais are saying, we don't want, the Thai population is saying, government don't, don't sign any more of these. And so Ch Laos is turning increasingly to Vietnam and Vietnam is saying, what the heck, you know, we're not, you're destroying our lower Mekong. You're participating in the destruction of the lower Mekong 
we're doing some of the, 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 the Mekong Delta, actually we're doing some of that ourselves. They don't say that, but they are. Um, uh, and, and so why don't you shift with how you make your electricity? You got lots of land. Why don't you put up windmills and, and, uh, and, uh, and solar and start producing electricity that way? It's far cheaper than the $2 billion you're spending for these dams. And you will be less environmental damage and we'll be happy to buy your electricity. And the Thais will probably be happy to buy your electricity then too. Uh, but yeah, you're, you're right. I, I uh, simplified it much too much. And um, you know, I'm glad you introduced that corrective. Thank you. Thank you. As we're coming um, to the end of our time, I'd, I'd just like to, to make a closing remark and then give um, our author and respondent also the last word. Um, but this is it, okay? I, I strongly recommend taking a look at it. Uh, it's beautifully written, as you would expect from an esteemed journalist. It's accessible for non-specialists or non-experts. It's organized, so that if you're interested in one country over another, you can just read that chapter. And it's sophisticated and accessible without dumbing down a very complicated subject. You had 20 minutes, you had 600 pages, so sure, your discussion of the Mekong might be uh, a little bit general. Um, but with that, uh, perhaps, um, Elena, if you have a, a closing comment, and then um, we'll give Murray the last word. Yeah, I, I'd just like to echo what you said about Murray's uh, tour of the region. Um, it's, uh, it touches on many things from hard power to soft power, particularly like um, the section on um, the Chinese in Indonesia, that's always a very complicated subject to tackle and Murray did it really well. Um, I will say that um, I noticed a, a question in the chat about ASEAN. I think um, uh, to the contrary, actually, I think that ASEAN will continue to pursue resilience, uh, economic resilience being one part of it, especially now with COVID, and, and that entails um, closer relations with China, but at the same time, trying to balance, Jay, you mentioned balance, um, the relations with other powers as well, uh, particularly with the US. And the last word, Murray, thank you. <laughs> well, I just want to, before I say anything else, just thank Alina and you, Jay, for moderating this. It's been, been a lot of fun, lots of interesting questions. I've done a, quite a number of these things. I, I've heard vocabulary here like crypto colonialism, which I haven't been asked anywhere else. <laughs> um, so that's been interesting. And I really appreciate your, your interest in this topic. You know, the uh, uh, sitting in Washington, D.C. Uh, and watching what may be a transition <laughs> to the uh, for the government, um, uh, I guess I... You know, this is not really covered in the book because I didn't know what would happen in the elections, obviously, but, but I'm hopeful that the uh, new administration, one of the things that the ASEAN's always said, I said, well, so, so you got these pressures from China, what, what, what would you like to see happen? And they always say, we don't want the U.S. to leave. We find the U.S. only sporadically interested in us. <laughs> the rest of the time, they just sort of disappear. Um, and we find the Trump administration, they don't show up at our meetings, they find them boring. Um, and uh, but, uh, uh, we would like you to be economically more engaged. Uh, we would like, you know, if you can't do the Trans-Pacific Partnership, find some other way to stay engaged because we have trade agreements and we're with China and we're involved in the Belt and Road and we really would like alternatives. Japan pride provides some in the infrastructure space, but only some. And so I, I guess I would hope that the new administration, once we get past COVID and get the economy going again and maybe get race, race justice issues resolved, <laughs> that we can, it's a small agenda, Biden should have that done in three weeks, right? Uh, but we'll, I would hope that, uh, <clears throat> that the administration uh, will look to Southeast Asia. It's, it's at the crossroads between the Indian and Pacific Oceans. It's, really very critical location and so they're a significant uh, uh, economic force in themselves. And I'd like to see the administration 
uh, just be more active uh, and uh, provide the balance that the Southeast Asians think they need. Not to throw China out, but to just keep China a little bit honest and keep them a little off balance so they can't move forward any further in their, their advances in the region. Thank you very much. So on behalf of the Ash Center, once again, uh, I would like to thank Murray and Elena for sharing their insights with us. And one of the best signs of a good book talk is a long queue of unanswered questions that we couldn't get to. So um, congratulations and thank you very much uh, for sharing your insights. Thank you.